Well, thank you, John. Yeah, we're very excited to be here. Yes, yes. Applaud, applaud loud, yes. <laughs> no. Um, we feel like motivational speakers wearing these things. <laughs> yeah, we are incredibly uncomfortable with this. Our yes. voices are being projected. Yeah, so yeah. don't mind don't mind the awkwardness. <laughs> we're usually really awkward when we talk together anyway, but I think it's going to be more awkward tonight. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Starting now. Starting now. Oh. Yes. Awkwardness um, begins. But no, seriously, uh, we are we are artists. Um, we're not professional lecturers. Um, we want to have conversation. We haven't even mentioned it, but if anyone's interested in doing studio visits, if you guys want us to come and do guest studio visits, what have you, um, I don't know if that's... Is that acceptable? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, just because... Uh, as it shows up here, if you find anything that we're presenting tonight engaging or you want to have a, a more intimate conversation about your work, have another view, uh, we're more than happy to do that with you guys, and we can arrange that however. Um, but yeah, so we're going to kind of like, we, we try not to over plan these things so that it's a rigid formation um, that you guys are going to be experiencing. We want this to any point, if anyone has a comment or, or something that they would like to ask, please, please, please feel free. It makes us feel less of a barrier between <laughs> yeah. here of, you know, you and us. Um, so, Sarah, take it away. Okay. Yeah. We'll have to stop <laughs> Joseph from talking so much. Um, okay. So, what we're just going to start with is Joseph and I are going to talk a little bit about how we started to collaborate. Uh, we've been, we met each other in 2004, so we've been together for around 11 years, but we've only been collaborating for about five years now. Um, when we were both in, when, when I met Joseph and I was, I was in my undergrad, we were both making work completely individually, kind of helping each other, but we really didn't like each other's work at all. Um, we would just help, and then we'd, some, we'd ask each other what we thought, and we'd be like, oh, it's great, it's great, and we really hated each other's work. Um, <laughs> really bad. We really hated it. Uh, but we, for some reason, kept kept uh, together. But we were amazing, like, assistants we with helped each, each other. other. Yeah. I come from a very, like, strong mold-making background, so I have a lot of material knowledge, and Sarah has an equally uh, impressive material knowledge from a more fibrous background. So we were helping each other with felting techniques or silicones and urethane rubbers, mm -hmm. what have you. And so we did that together for... About until about 2008 was when uh, we moved. We ended up moving back here to Chicago. Joseph and I were living in Philadelphia, and Joseph got into school at the Art Institute of Chicago. And he was in school, and I just finished. Gra I had just graduated from Tyler, and I was really miserable. <laughs> I was working as a frozen buyer at Whole Foods. Um, I was working in like negative 20 degree weather, like freezer weather every day and cold and kind of sad. Um, and Joseph was having fun in grad school and was kind of wild and all over the place. And we started talking about working together, but realized that it was very difficult for us to do it with his kind of crazy schedule and my just like being like stuck at my job all the time. So we made a plan that if we, uh, well, we got engaged and then we said, if I get into grad school, that we'll work one year together and see what happens and just kind of try it. Because Joseph's really pretty crazy and wild and doesn't have any control at all in any way at all. Um, and and I, I, I will admit it. Yes. yes it's yes. true. Yes. yes. And I get really, really anal about things and like I'm very, I have like a lot of attention to detail and I tend to, I, I would tend to overthink projects. And so we kind of were like, we're very different from each other. We don't like each other's work. Let's see what happens if we spend one year together. So the first year was kind of a mess. Um, we made a little bit of everything. And um, we, well, we had both chosen to go into the performance department as well because I was coming off of, uh, in my undergrad, I was doing a lot of painting that then started to lead into kind of uh, sculpture and assemblage. And, and uh, in my tenure away from my undergrad in real world, you know, uh, I was managing Pearl in Philadelphia. And I was like, it's time to go back to school. But I was kind of looking for a new language, a new way of, of engaging this practice. And kind of like to, to, for me, it was a way of kind of building, taking down the barrier between myself and my work. I wanted myself to be more engaged in my work because I would go and I would, I would approach a piece and it was always a piece that I was making, you know? And there wasn't this kind of inherent 
connection that I was feeling with my work. And so by engaging the body and engaging like the, the action of the body and the ritual of the body into the work, I felt like that was a way in which I could really start to build a connection with my pieces. So I wouldn't stand back and be like feeling this, this disparity between me and my work. Um, and that's what kind of led me into performance and equally for Sarah as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got into the, I was in I was applying for fibers and performance and decided to go to, into the fi, uh, into the performance department for the same reason just to try but it, mostly for me to just try something different because I didn't want to feel I didn't want to feel like bound by one specific medium. Um, I was already at that point where I was interested in certain things and feeling like oh this isn't going to work this can't work as a painting it has to be a video or it has to be a photograph and I can't just be a painter or just be fiber or just be a sculptor it has to be whatever whatever the the need for um, for the piece. So then yes yeah, so we worked together for a couple of years and made this long trajectory. We decided not to kind of just show like a timeline of work, but there was this very specific moment uh, for Joseph and I. We, we didn't know what we liked together. We were kind of just making art together and really thinking about like as art um, and not thinking about what are we really interested in? What are we in love with? What can we make that, what can we think about that we can fall in love with and then make work that looks at it so that we're actually excited about it and we're not just thinking only about art. Which is that pressure that a lot of us feel or even going into graduate school, these pressures never decrease when you're feeling like, oh, I have to have that, like, that special something. I have to have that thing. And you're always like trying to find that thing, but that thing isn't, you know, you. And so for us it was... It was unpacking for about a year and a half of it just was like three years. <laughs> really bad performances where and we really were really bad sculptures performing in front of people and doing things we didn't want to do. Yeah, um, but doing it and it was really good for us. Yeah, uh, but then we went on this really long road trip and we were really into. Both of us are into Radio Lab and we're constantly going on road trips. Our honeymoon was a month long, just traveling across the country. No, the rules were um, only a t only sleep in a tent and have to make all of our own food, and so we got to be outdoors a lot. And that was those were things that we s realized that we both really enjoyed together. But it was this kind of simple. It wasn't this like this is what we're making work about. This is like this is how we're going to start to find what we're interested in. And we were listening to this Radio Lab, which is one of our favorite things to listen to on road trips. Did and anyone listen to Radio Lab in here? Yeah. A couple, yeah, yeah. Best awesome. thing ever. A lot of front row seats here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take notes, Radio Lab, yes. <laughs> um, and we, we listened to this one, it was about space, and there was uh, Andrian, who is married to Carl Sagan, who is one of the greatest kind of astronomer scientists of our time, uh, one of the very few scientists that could really touch the public. He wasn't a scientist for, for other scientists. He was for everybody. And um, his wife, Andrean, they met, and we won't tell the story because it's really long, but it's really romantic, and we were just crying because it was beautiful. They fell in love. They wrote The Cosmos together. They wrote a ton of books together. Like Every book that has his name on it has her name on it somewhere. And um, they were with each other until he passed away. And so she's telling this love story and talking about this kind of shared love. The way they found their love was through this thing they were both, um, that they were both like interested in and in love with separately. And that's kind of how they, how they became, uh, or how they came together. And it was kind of this really special moment for us. And um, it was this moment when we were just like, this is what we, this is it. This is what we've been building towards. Like we could see it in our work and then it kind of just hit us after both of us crying in the car on this road trip. Um, you want to talk for a minute so I don't talk too much? Well, yeah, I mean, just in relationship to the Voyager satellite project, which was launched in 1977, which is a project that Carl Sagan and Andrew Ian fell in love working on together, um, is now, there's still debate over it, but of last year, it is the very first man-made object, right? If you could imagine us right now, we're on this planet, pretty small, right, in our solar system, but then our solar, so we're hurling around the sun, right? The solar system itself is not stagnant. We're hurling around within our spiral arm in our galaxy. The galaxy itself 
is not stagnant, okay? But, so for the very first time ever, and we should have been having parades in the street, but the very first man-made object left the sun's gravitational pull. And on that satellite, again, launched in 1977, is this golden record. And on that record is an account of humanity. So, it, and Earth. not just humanity, but of Earth, yes. It's got humpback whale songs. It's got people saying hello and I love you and biorhythms recorded on it. It's got images. Uh, it's a really amazing thing that everyone should check out. But, and so that for us started to produce a different scale relationship and a different way of approaching like how we were looking at our work because we're very political, we're very concerned with, um, uh, with, with the environment, the environment uh, with, with all of these, these issues that are very, very much facing us right now. But for Sarah and I to approach that like in our own work, it became very complex and, and kind of like a bit too mucky. It felt like your feet in wet clay kind of. Kind of just felt like I can't make work about this even though it's something I'm very concerned with. So we really started to look outward as a way of kind of producing different scale relationships of like looking outward but also looking back because also the Voyager was the satellite project that sent back the very first image of Earth from the rings of Saturn and it's called the pale blue dot which is you know this paramount image of like human success in Thanks technology. Thanks for bringing that up. Yes. I didn't put it in the, the PowerPoint. There's no image of it. Sorry, yeah. guys. <laughs> so we're going to kind of, we, I don't want we're going to end up talking too much because we're really good at that. Um, so you can probably tell. Uh, so Joseph and I, we went to the Hayden Planetarium in New York and we got to touch our first meteorite, which is this meteorite. Um, we couldn't go in it like these creepy like children are in it, which these are some of our favorite pictures. There's <clears throat> tons of images of these online. Um, when, when they used to have the, um, it's called the Willamette meteorite, when it used to lay down, but now it's kind of like upwards, but you can still go and like hug it, which is awesome. And so that was the first time we got to really like see a meteorite in person and touch one and think about it. And the thing that we loved the most about this one was that it was, I mean, it traveled through space for an incredibly long time. It was born out of the beginning of our solar system, um, out of the beginning of the universe. And it uh, fell finally at one point on Earth um, in the 1800s, and it fell and it landed on a glacier, and it became a glacier erratic, which means that the, um, the glacier carried it. So it fell, so it's been flying, trying to find this home, finally lands, lands on Earth, but lands on something and then continues to move. And it was carried from Canada into the United States. And then there's like a lot of like, history about it with uh, people stealing it and fighting over it and so on, so on, and now it's at the, um, the, at the Hayden. But because it sat on top of a glacier, it was beaten by all the weather, so you can see, like, it's not, like, kind of this just solid rock. It's actually just completely, like, iron. It's metal now. <coughs> all the rock, um, all these, like, holes that make it kind of look like a giant raisin in a way, um, that's all what used to be stone. Uh, so Joseph and I got really into this, and we were, we've been making, we've, really into making rocks, like making these kind of fake rocks. Um, we tend to never really use real materials, um, like the actual objects in our art. We kind of like to replicate them. So we started with making, this is the best picture I have of it, but this is our mini Willamette meteorite, and this is me just hanging from it. Uh, we'll make stuff. We love playing in the studio. We're really into experimenting and just kind of trying and seeing, seeing what can happen when we're, when we're just playing. We don't say no. We have a very, very big rule um, of never saying no, which is something that we um, learned the opposite of in grad school was everything was problematic. You'd say an idea and the teacher would be like, this is problematic because, or uh, you should think about and it you more. You have to think, oh, I have to justify every single thing. And then all of a sudden you're making work and you're like, this is about this, this is about this, this is about or this. Or then you hate it And it's you're just bored. like, uh, nobody wants to hear you talk. Nobody wants to look at your work. <laughs> you don't even want to look at your own work, Right. And so we just said, like, we have to get fresh and loose again and get wild and, and find that creative muse. We have to be wild and not be worried about, like, what everyone is going to always be thinking, like, about the work because we might just be bad artists. And at some point, you just have to deal with that fact. But if you're being true to yourself and you're working diligently and you're passionate about what you do, then w who cares, right? 
because you're doing your work and you're doing it well, even if it doesn't get the response, you know? <laughs> so on. So. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so we've been, so we've, the, again, these are kind of out of order. We didn't do, we didn't want to go from like beginning to end. So this is actually one of our very first pieces that we did thinking about space. We were really interested in wanting to engage the body. When Joseph and I were in the performance department, we were forced to perform so many times in front of people that we hated it. And we like got very, we were very anti-performance for a good year out of grad school. Uh, just because we were, we didn't feel like we wanted to be in front of people. Like that wasn't important Like for right us. now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But we, but we were really interested in the idea of a body engaging something like, because we think about it all the time in sculpture. Sometimes, a lot of times things are sitting and the body does walk around it, but we really wanted to kind of physically engage people. So we made 2,000 of these fake rocks, um, similar to the ones that were thrown at you guys uh, earlier, <laughs> and um, put them on metal, like kind of thin wire metal poles, and put them all over um, the Logan Square Boulevard. It's near the space called the Comfort Station, which is like kind of an alternative art space. And they let us use their lawn. And so we basically allowed people to just run through a meteorite field and kind of get that experience. So these things bounce around. We had a lot of people riding bikes through them, doing some things that were a little, a little too intense for us. But it turned out to be like this really interesting thing, getting to people. Like the very first night when we finished installing them, we had people from the bar across the street start running through them, like screaming that they were going through an asteroid field. And we're like, this is perfect. This is exactly, this is what we're kind of, this is what we want. This is what we're trying to find. It's kind of getting people to think a little bit about what's up, what's up. Um, and not just like thinking about what we see in front of us all the time. Because there's so much more than just like our, the block or the campus you live on or uh, the town that you live in. Um, I don't want to over talk. Oh, no, you're doing really well. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, should I keep going then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so so then we we've been we got approached uh, by the Museum of Contemporary Art to do a couple different um, programs. So one of them was the Apocalypse, which we'll actually show um, an image and a video from. Uh, but our first project with them, they wanted us to they wanted us to perform, and we were like, well, why do, why do people keep asking us to perform? This isn't we don't perform live. Like they're not we don't like doing it. Um, it's just it's not it doesn't fit into where we're at right now. Uh, so we wanted to kind of do some type of programming where we didn't maybe have like all the control and that we weren't specifically performing. So we built, uh, we made these different giant fake kind of meteorites and we put them on wheels. And then we asked for, um, we got an artist, an opera singer, a scientist from um, the museum of, um, or the field museum who dealt specifically in kind of the curation of the meteorite collection there. And then also a planetary scientist at the Adler Planetarium who also was really into studying meteorites. We asked all four of them to come in to the museum. During the day, the, the giant rocks were being pushed around and people could ride them and kind of move them around in the space. But then at night, they all kind of came together and each one of um, these professionals, they told some form of a story. And so Philip from um, the Field Museum did like a really geeky PowerPoint, just expected from a scientist that was really cute. The Adler, um, the planetary scientist, he told this poetic, beautiful story comparing the Flying Dutchman, which is um, this ship. It's a kind of a tale of a ship that never kind of like ever like kind of sets like into a dock, kind of just forever looking, forever searching and compared them to meteorites. And then Aaron, the artist, um, told this another very poetic story and played video um, of kind of like this reproduction of this person flying through space. And then it ended with the opera singer singing an opera that she wrote about meteorites. And it was kind of this really, it was really fun for us because we didn't ask them to tell us what they were doing. We just wanted them to kind of come in and each tell their own story for five minutes and that they would all kind of get one. So it's kind of like a mini This American Life for us in a way, which was really kind of fun to do. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing. Um, oh, so here's the one. Uh, this is, so this is the next uh, kind of event that we did at the MCA. We, they asked us if we wanted to do another piece. Um, we actually had proposed both those pieces at the, at the same time and realized very quickly that this one was not ever going to get approved by the Museum of Contemporary Art. Like we were like, they're never going to say yes. And so we decided on the one. And then finally, uh, Michael Green, who we were working with, was like, hey guys, I got them to approve it. They said, yes, we're gonna do it for our first Fridays because it's like a party night anyway. And so 
again, we dumped our, like right around like be, around 1,500 uh, squishy like Nerf meteorites onto people. Um, we have actually, um, I got one video of it, and it's from uh, one of our friends. Uh, friends, they gave it to us. So it's not very great quality. Oh no, we don't have a, we don't have sound. I guess that's okay, right? I can crank it. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh no, there is sound. Never mind. It's very loud. Yeah, and so this meteor fight, which is our my wonderful friend Kelsey, who started the meteorite fight and then almost got everybody in really big trouble for doing it. Um, I got that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, yeah. Joseph's dad and his mom came, and they were like throwing meteorites at us while we were trying to protect people from throwing meteorites. And in then the there was galleries. this poor woman laying on the floor. I mean, people were getting pretty. I mean, it was breaking down. Like things were breaking down. It was really my fun. parents were sitting there pegging this woman with these fake meteorites, and I'm like. <laughs> What has happened? Everything is yeah. no. It needs yeah. to stop. That was the first time Joseph's parents liked our art. Though. Yeah, that was yeah. really, really yeah. awesome. Because they constantly are just like, "What are you guys doing? We don't like what you're doing. You're wasting your lives." And then they're like, "That was really fun," and so that was a really good, good moment for us um, that they got to see that. Um, so we're gonna keep going. So I don't want to go. I know we're probably like, gonna yeah, we should have had a timer. So. I know. I forgot. Um, that's why I was asking you for your phone, but I don't have. I mine. turned it off. <sighs> Um, so, so then we, we also got asked to do a piece at the Arts Club of Chicago, which is this really wonderful space that's very famous for never letting Chicago artists do anything at the space, even though it is called the Arts Club of Chicago. Uh, so they finally asked, we got, uh, we got to be the first Chicago artist to um, show there for more than like an hour long kind of performance. And they asked us to do a large scale installation outside. And so we created these uh, six giant meteorites um, all on like fiberglass poles. So the tallest one's up at about 20 feet tall. And we had to figure out a way to fabricate them, figure out a way completely on our own to like hoist them um, with, I think the most we ever had were two people helping us hoist them. Um, and we got to have them outside for about five, five months almost. Um, I'll show a closer picture of them. And the idea of them was based on afterglow. Joseph and I have been getting really in interested in color and interested in like the idea of color, especially dealing with space. And these are actually glow in the dark. Didn't work quite as well in the city, but they did glow, not as vibrantly as we had hoped for, but they did a pretty good job. But we, they were covered in glow in the dark pigments. Um, this bright green isn't glow in the dark, but pretty much the rest of it is all glow in the dark. And they were supposed to absorb sunlight throughout the day, and then at night they would start to emit, um, emit that glow, which is based on the idea of like afterglow. So when you see a sunset, um, and the sun goes down over the horizon, and you kind of get that really gorgeous like pink, like filling up the sky, that's afterglow. I don't know if you want to talk any more about this piece. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess in this point too, this is just something that like as we as we're researching these things. Like, we've gotten incredibly dorked out on the periodic table. And, and we're, like, reinvestigating ourselves into physics and astronomy and, um, and even math. I mean, I mean <laughs> these things. But, well. but these are things that, like, in our earlier education, that we, weren't, we weren't finding explicit kind of connections towards. And, and what's happened is, is that we've reintroduced like a really energetic research methodology into our practice. We live, eat, breathe what we do. We never, ever turn off. Um, and so what that means is that we follow those tangents, those wormholes, and we're also really interested in the idea of the amateur, is that you don't have to be qualified like, in any at, like, specific yeah. thing to start researching in that field, to start having a curiosity with those things and really dig in on it. I mean, these are, because 
so often we feel like we're, we're in education too. We're, we're saying this and this and this and this, and that there's certain areas of expertise or, you know, like you're, you're not qualified to really go into sociology or paleontology or, or philosophy. Like these are all things that we are deeply curious in and we are investigating actively in our work. And how we manifest that isn't to be like didactic. We're not trying to preach at you in specific ways of what we're researching or learning or we're not trying to translate specific things within our research into pieces, but rather just being curious and inspired 24-7 and just allowing ourselves to feel the freedom of exploration in, into any field, into anything. And so, yeah, this is all based on this <laughs> thing in physics called forbidden transitions, and that's europium and strontium aluminate uh, are the chemical elements that are, comprise this glow-in-the-dark material. But what happens is, is the photon travels in and gets confused and does not take the most efficient route inside of this material. And so what you're actually seeing in glow-in-the-dark material is simply a delay of the release of a photon, Right? The, the photon that's created inside of the core of the sun takes 100,000 years to get to the surface of the sun and only eight minutes when it hits the surface of the sun to get to Earth, okay? And that's because of these complex pathways inside of these different structures. So, yeah, they glow in the dark too, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's fun. It's kind of cool. Um. <coughs> I have a question about that. Yeah. Yes. So, the poles are fiberglass, which means they're not totally rigid. Right? Oh, no, they sway. So they, they bend and, yeah, they, they sway they, and they like make around. you kind of clench your teeth as the artist, too, because you're like, oh my God, I hope I did well enough that this isn't going to fall on someone. No, I was like really surprised. <laughs> we, we submitted multiple proposals, and that was the one we really wanted to do. And she, we're like, she's never going to say yes to this one. And she said yes to it. And we we're like, this is, a, this is scary. We warned her, this is a scary proposal. And then she was like, that sounds great. I love it. And we put the first one up. And she's like, this is really scary looking. And she was like stepping back. And we're like, we told you. Like, we're scared And it was too. like in a wind tunnel downtown. Yeah. There and were actually the tornado weekend, uh, it was weather. up. It's like yeah. 70 miles an we hour We were getting 70 mile an hour gusts. And we were, were just like, sitting in our living room, like shaking. And we finally called the, mu- we called the space. And we were like, is it okay? Hey, how's, how's everything how's looking? How does it look? Does it look okay? We're not worried. But does it look okay? And it was all right. It was yeah. all right. Um, but we did, yeah, we did end up doing yeah, a good enough it job. It was fine. Yeah. yeah it, but we kind, of, we kind of built the design on how I used to raise mast on sailing boats. Sailing boats? Boats that sail. Um, <laughs> but this kind of way of like an Iwo Jima kind of point pin, and then the, the piece would lift up and then slip down into a collar that was 36 inches into the ground. So, I mean... We had to dig it, a lot of holes. Theoretically, I mean, it would be almost impossible for that to... To fall apart yeah. or break or anything. Yeah, and we spent, yeah, and we called engineering companies and we're like, hey, we're artists, we're doing this piece, we're putting giant rocks up in the air. What's the best material? And what can we use? What they told and us to use. Yeah. So we call and we ask questions constantly. Yeah. And you got their names in case it fell over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so aside from doing some like really big kind of crazy things, we're just going to show you a couple of quick little things that we did. Uh, again, as we go through our, re- our, our, we research all the time. We're constantly like going through, um, especially like the NASA website because they have all this really brand new, beautiful stuff. And then they have all their old web pages that look like they're from like when the internet was born. And, and they so, are. Yeah. Oh yeah. They, yeah. they haven't updated they them haven't or updated anything. Them. Yeah. But they're, we, we're, in, we're really interested and we've actually been working on like a series of trips to go and collect these. Uh, but this is from our first piece. There's something called uh, moon trees. And so in um, one of the first uh, trips to the moon, they basically, um, NASA gave one of the astronauts all these different seeds for different, uh, different trees. They brought them up, they went around the moon, and the idea was they wanted to see what would happen if there was no gravity. Um, and if it would actually affect the seed. Because at that point, we had no idea. Like we, the first Apollo astronauts spent, t- like when they came back after landing on the moon, they had to spend like quarantine for like, I think it was like two or three weeks where they couldn't come up because they weren't sure what was up there. And so the same thing, they didn't know for sure if like, grav- if going up to space was gonna like actually affect something from being able to grow. Well, when they brought the tube with the seeds back down and they were getting ready to like disinfect, they broke open the tube and so the whole 
project, the science experiment, was completely invalid. They couldn't use them anymore um, to be able to like make like a scientific like this is definitely going to be okay. You know, the seeds will grow or not. But the astronaut was kind of bummed about it, so he brought the seeds over to a place in California and got them all propagated. And almost every single one of them uh, turned into a little seedling, and then they got planted across the United States. And they're all over the place, and the website's really shaky about where some of them are, because they don't really have perfect, like, they don't have this great database. And so some places you go to, which this, the one that we uh, took leaves from was in Washington Square Park in uh, Philadelphia. But they're also, like, they're all over. They're in, like, um, like Girl Scout camps. Girl Scout camps with like little like hand painted wooden signs. Some of them have plaques. They're all over. And so like part of our trip is uh, like one of the things we're doing is taking trips and trying to collect all these leaves. So the first ones we didn't know what to do with them. We put them in a book. We just wanted them. And so we took these two little leaves and we brought them home. And a few months later, we were trying to figure out what what we were going to do with them because we didn't want to like just make scans of them or frame them and trying to play with them. And we're like, what do we actually care about this? And it was important to us because. The um, having like having this thing that came from space, like why do we care about this thing? And it's because we Joseph and I want to kind of be a part of that in a, in a way. And so we decided that it was really important for us to kind of consume these leaves. And so I'll play this really quickly, which is like the worst mistake we've ever made. But the video worked out well. And then what you don't see after that is us gagging and like falling over and really upset that we made that decision. Yeah, I mean, you think it's a leaf, but it, it was so dried bad. in a book for six months. Yeah. That thing was incredibly, I mean, it was not hydrating itself in your mouth. And you were like, the video's playing. We only have one leaf each and we have to swallow this thing. And so, yeah, I mean, it's just a little experiment, but we, we do these experiments all the time. And, and think about 90% the of the gestures. time, they don't, you know, manifest themselves enough that we, like, appreciate them for certain qualities. But this one was just one of those rare occurrences where it actually worked. Yeah, yeah we really are excited about doing kind of quick stuff and long stuff. So projects that take an incredibly long period of time and then something that takes us, like, two minutes. Um, and so I'll show one more. One more of these types of videos. Um, this is a project we did. Joseph and I, oh, I'll stop it real quick. So Joseph and I um, got a bunch of different lenses. We went to the science store and just bought a ton of lenses for fun to see what we could do with them. And we found this one and realized very quickly that it could just burn everything. Like you put it near sunlight and it just lights everything on fire. And I was like sitting in a chair holding it once and like lit my chair on fire. And we were really excited about that in some ways, um, knowing how dangerous the stupid lens is. It's like this little piece of plastic. But we were kind of interested in this idea of like being able to take the sun and be able to like harness that kind of energy. And again, doing these kind of quick actions. I'll play it and we can talk about it again. This is us looking really cool in Vermont. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this design is actually called Fresnel, and its first uh, commercial application is used in lighthouses. It's concentric lenses that are prismatically just shape all the beams of light into one center point. It's actually also commonly used uh, for people who need help uh, reading and seeing that you can lay it like on top of a book. I'm sure you've seen it at they one point. They were used in overhead projectors. I mean, they've had a million applications. Mm -hmm. uh, they're now currently being used 
as one of the most efficient ways of producing solar power on Earth is they're actually producing in the same pattern of a Fresnel lens, but giant mirror fields out in the desert that condense all the light and heat to produce steam that go up these giant, a giant center shaft. But what they've discovered is, is now that they, 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 as they were building this, there was this, there was this turtle habitat that they had to be very aware of, and they've worked all around it. As soon as the thing went up, they and didn't realize running, the air would be like 500 degrees. Birds started flying in, and, and they, they just, just catch on fire instantly. Yeah. And so now, I can't remember, they're called like burners, but they're killing thousands and thousands of birds. Like every and day. it's like an incredible problem. Yeah, I think it was like 30,000 in like And it's also, months. yeah, it's just hilarious that that was never considered. As, yeah, that uh, the air would be that hot that they yeah. would just fry anything that came in it. Um, okay. Wait, John, you, were you oh. asking a question? Oh, just, uh, they use Fresnel lenses in theaters. Yeah, <laughs> yep, yep, the theater lights and, yep. Um, so, so Joseph and I make everything together, and we also do, a, like, all of our sculptures, we really started to, like, lose our hand in our work, um, because we were trying to, like, we were working together, trying to make singular things, and kind of developing a hand together, and we also wanted to start kind of playing separately and making work a little bit independently, but not completely independently, and right around that time, we got a telescope, and... In Chicago, we couldn't see anything, but we could see the moon, and that was the one thing, and we don't, it's not really a very good telescope either, but we could see the moon, and it was so transformative for us, being able to see it, because like, it's something you see all the time, and you notice, and sometimes it's really beautiful, and you're like, oh, a beautiful moon, and that's about it, but this night, we just sat and stared at the moon all night through, because it gets so close to you when you look at it through the eyepiece that you feel like you can like touch it, like it's just right there, and it's gorgeous and it's like glittery and it's it was just one of the most magical nights we'd ever had and throughout that night we started just kind of talking about um like thinking about just drawing it and how we could kind of recreate that moon surface in a way and joseph and i decided to go inside and try to both remember what we saw through the telescope and carve a moon so we just used this uh, pink polystyrene. It's kind of it's used for house insulation. This foam, and we use Dremel tools and a couple of other tools, but mostly just Dremels, and drew the moon, which is basically carving it. And kind of got into it and ended up taking silicone mixed with simulated lunar regolith, which is just fake moon dirt. It's what scientists use to test um, rovers on or for any scientific experiment because we can't just bring like truckloads of moon dirt home. And so we mixed it in with the silicone, laid it on, and then peeled off these pieces. So we end up calling them moon skins, which is this idea that like we could go up to the moon, lay out silicone, and just peel it off and kind of create this impression. And so we started doing them independently, each one of us. We made a quite a big ser like a pretty big series of these big kind of black uh, pieces, anywhere from like 48 inches um, by 48 inches down to like little tiny like 12 by 12s. Um, I'll let you talk a little bit too. Yeah, I mean, and just how we were thinking about these is, is really this kind of impression and tactility of, of a memory and reinterpreting these, the way in which, you know, your memory functions and how, like, as soon as you create a memory and you access it, it's constantly changing, right? We all know this, but we're really interested in, in how we're constantly mediating all of these things and especially as we look at a, a different... Uh, different things that are very impactful, you know, uh, as far as scale relationships and distances. So we just really wanted to, like, locally try to interact with this thing and then reinterpret it through our memory. And, and we thought about, like, the process in which we were using is actually this kind of impression, you know, this mold-making process, but using the mold as the positive. Yeah, which is something, kind of yeah, we, we constantly were using silicone in our art and in our business, but only for the purposes of actual mold-making, so to produce another object, and use this stuff forever, and it took a very long time for us to suddenly go, like, we love this material, like, there's something wonderful about this material, why don't we use that? rather than just constantly using it to make something else or to make something out of plastic or wax or, or whatever. Um, so we ended up doing some pretty large just ones. Well, no, you yeah. can't. Um, this is a detail. We'll go really fast. No, I just want to make sure we're not going <laughs> way over. We have no idea up here. 
Okay. okay we're doing yeah. all right. So, yeah. We'll just go real fast now. Stick with us. Yeah. We'll finish up. We'll try to make you, we'll throw out some more zingers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is a detail of one of the moon skins. Um, and you can see they get kind of very, very velvety and have this strange kind of, you kind of know what the material is, but you don't. And um, all the marks, again, because we're carving the positives, when we pour the silicone in, we're getting these kind of strange negatives out of it. Um, so again, we're getting really into color. This is just to start off this next image that, um, from one of our the next pieces we did. But Joseph and I started looking at, uh, again, at meteorites. And these are pieces of the Vesta um, asteroid. But these are like meteorites that fell from it and that we have here on Earth. And the Jet Propulsion Laboratories, they put them through different polarizing telescopes. So again, like meteorites, they just look like little rocks to us, um, brown, gray, silvery. And putting them through a polarizing telescope or a microscope lets you kind of see the different mineral deposits, the different bits and pieces that our eyes can't see. And so that they, we, we're interested in the idea of like these things that exist but don't exist because when we're looking at something through a filter or anybody who takes a picture and you put it through Photoshop and you like fix the color a little or you change something just a little or like, like brighten the image, you're kind of... You're changing it, but also like your camera is changing it in a way. And so it's like this kind of strange, like it's not like it's a fake image, but it's this weird space between it being real and not real. Um, and it, it does exist in some sense. And so the same idea, like, again, like we can't see x-rays. X-rays exist. They don't really exist too much on Earth except in x-ray machines, but we can't see an x-ray, but we can see what an x-ray does to a piece of film. And... So these are different like polarizing uh, views of, um, of all the minerals in, um, in these meteorites. And so we took those images. This is to give you a sense of the scale because we, we get to work in these really fun places. This is called the, um, the Franklin. This is in Chicago. This is uh, two artists um, that, well, one of them, she's an artist and her husband, he's a, fabri a furniture designer. And they built this 12 foot by 12 foot kind of like strange shack in their backyard and they have openings there. And so they asked us if we wanted to do a show. And so we filled it with these really, really big meteorites on bungee cords. Um, and we painted them similar to the colors of the Vesta asteroid from the polarizing uh, microscopic views. And we wanted this space that, like, they gave us a space and it's, like, small but big. And the idea for us was we really want people to be able to have to, like, kind of maneuver their way. They could bump into the meteorites. They're going to bounce around and knock into each other and knock into people. Um, but that you kind of have to, like really negotiate the space uh, with these huge objects in it that also are kind of like mostly your body size. Like some of them are a little bit smaller, but they're pretty much like human sized. Um, and in this space, we had these two hands. Um, one is mine and one is Joseph's. And they were uh, hooked onto a little motor. And in our hands were little tiny meteorites, um, actual real ones. And both of our hands, uh, the me our hands would shake. They're made out of silicone. And so when they're attached to the motor, our hands would just shake on the wall and jiggle the little meteorites around, which is something that we've been constantly talking to people. Every time we handed somebody a meteorite, they would just tell us that they felt it vibrating. They felt that magic in it. It's not vibrating. They're not vibrating. But you understand that. Well, everything that. is vibrating. Yes. But yeah. they're not, yes. yeah. But they're not vibrating any more magically than other things. But it's that idea, that thought. And it is, because like, you hold this thing, and you're like, this thing is older. It's older than our Earth. It's so old. It's so magical. It's so special. And it landed here on this planet. And so it's this kind of really important thing for us to think about. Um, and also, like, every, like, again, everybody was holding them. We're like, this is what it feels like. It feels like magic in your hand. Do you want to say more about it? I'm trying to be no, fast. No, that's perfect. Okay, yeah, great. We We're do. done with that yeah. one. Um, so again, a little bit more just talking about color um, and this idea of like how we're kind of making our own color. Um, when the mission, it was, uh, I'm going to forget its name, Mariner 4? Oh, shoot. Um, there were one of the first missions to Mars to actually take the first pictures of Mars, when um, the, the satellite got up there to take the photos, it was bringing back all this data, but the image, the actual like, photograph was taking way, way too long. This is the very first photograph that we were receiving back from this alien planet. Yeah. I mean, these scientists were excited. Yeah, but it was taking too long. So they had all the numbers, they had all the data. And so what they ended up doing was printing out all the numbers and doing... this like ticker tape. Well, I'm going to show them in a yeah. second. It's on there. Cool. You didn't look at Great. the thing very, very well. Um, 
Uh, but they, they ended up doing like a paint by number. And they actually picked these colors very randomly. They just wanted to use them for contrast and then later found out, oh, hey, that's the color of Mars. Because we didn't know what Mars looked like, the actual colors of it. Um, but you can kind of see it's a little, oh, it's a little blown out. But you can kind of tell there's strips of paper and little tiny and just numbers printed on them. And those numbers are just, it's, they're just colorizing it. And then when the final, the image actually came through, it was like almost identical. But it's this kind of, again, this like play of like, of color that we're really interested in. And again, um, this is uh, Callisto, which is a moon in our solar system. And if you Google Callisto, there's way more than this, but these are all the different ways that different scientists or artists working for NASA or whatever, that are, they're changing the color up. So you never quite know what these things are. And that's something we're interested in a lot is like this data, this idea of you'll see illustrations of planets. We'll look at planets and we'll look at planets we actually can't see. We're getting data back. We're getting numbers back. And scientists can say to an artist, hey, we think this planet's like really cold and icy, so it's probably really white. And it might have some like, we think there's some activity here, so it might be a little bit different. And then an artist interprets that and changes what it is. So it's kind of, again, it's this thing of like, it's real, but not real. And it's not like, the data is not correct. And even these images, like all the Mars images, are always, always changed with color because Mars light is different than Earth light. And so when scientists are trying to look at like images of Mars, they can't understand them as well unless they're cut, like changed with the color to look like Earth. So they kind of like filter them to feel like Earth so they can kind of tell the minerals or tell the rocks apart and see them better. Um, okay. Oh, we're so close. Um, that's not that. It's just this angle. I think, oh, it is the angle. Okay, good. Um, so this is just one of the images. We only put two images in from the show we just took down at the MCA. Um, but we wanted to play with that same idea, so this idea of color. So Joseph and I started looking all, again, we started playing with, the, we, were, we really love making these moon skins. There's this kind of really special thing, um, special process. Like, we love every second of making them, which is sometimes rare in the work that we do because we have to do a lot of, like, pre-work before you can like have the fun um but these the start to finish is pretty awesome and so all the moons all the we started making these moons we made them deflated instead of doing these kind of just big square pieces we made really really big styrofoam balls like huge spheres and then carved those and then covered those with silicone and then peeled those off so they're kind of like these deflated balloons hanging on the wall um all the ones that are like black and gray, those are based off of our moon. But any of the ones with color, um, those are based off of many, many, many different images that we've gone through on Google of different planets, exoplanets, or moons um, in our solar system and beyond that have a potential for life. Not like that we know there's life there or anything, but that they have a possibility. Well, even that, of, like certain extremophiles may yeah. be able to exist. Yeah, there. not like not humans, even, like, terraforming, for but maybe humans, like a cell. Yeah, yeah, like a cell, yeah. like something could be there. And so we've recreated all these pieces and then um, working aside, uh, along with the curator kind of ended up arranging these in the space to kind of have this strange feeling of like creating a mini galaxy so they're not all hung at the same height. Um, and then in the other space, okay, it's not too dark. Um, in the other space, we ended up making one more giant moon skin, which was incredibly fun. It was uh, 24 feet by 12 feet. And on one side, this side, Joseph carved the largest crater um, that we have on Earth. So the largest like meteor impact or asteroid impact that we've ever had, um, which is the Redifort Dome. Um, so it's actually not even the full. And these aren't to scale. We decided to kind of cr make them the exact same size. And then on the left is the Aiken Basin on the moon. And this is the largest impact crater. So the one on the moon you can kind of see like is really like pockmarked. And that's because the moon doesn't really have any atmosphere. And so, and I also don't really have any weather. So there's no real change. Like there's still boot prints from the first steps of Mars or on the moon. And, um, and so this, the actual crater is this huge circle that's really faint, but it's been battered and battered and battered with more asteroids or meteorites. And then as opposed to the Redifort, which has been through tons and tons of weathering, erosion and changes. And so it starts to kind of fade and it's gotten like, much less like of like an actual like crater now. Anything you need to throw into that? No, and I mean, not to unpack yes. it for you, but we were just kind of looking at the way in which, you know, again, looking at memory and relationship to trauma 
and just kind of like letting that be an underlying poetics there, but not, ex we, we, we oftentimes don't care to explain our work to people. It either, it, it either connects and they emote themselves or, you know, they, they find themselves curious and, and attaching themselves to it or they don't. I mean, and that's just a hard thing. I mean, we're, it's not that we don't care about that or we don't strategize that in some form or fashion, but in the end, you know, that we're trying not to like give away everything to everybody. I mean, uh, something that we do often when we're teaching is we have our students go into the museum and say, find a work you love, find a work you hate, don't read the card, then read the card, you know, find these works, then read the card, and really look at how these experiences change for you. And, and, and just to be aware of like how these experiences occur as they relate to anyone going into the museum, looking at work, finding like what information is given by the piece, what information is given by the museum who's writing the card, you know, and really like just be aware of these structures of how people look at work because so often people spend 30 seconds with your work, you know, and so you just have to be like constantly playing around in that space and thinking about these engagements and what you want to, you know, how you want people to attach to the work or and so we often work in scale and in actual touch. Yeah, we're really interested in kind of having people have like an actual feeling um, and act, like to walk into a space and, and feel the art or want to kind of, we like making work that people want to touch, um, which sometimes gets us in trouble at like museums because we have to like fight for them to like not put up giant barricades in front of everything we make. But it's an it's a important part for us to have saying that people want to kind of grasp or hold on to or touch or try to figure out what that, even what the material it is, because that just gives them a few more seconds of actually kind of engaging with the work. Um, just to show you guys really quick, these are, we, we, we're so close, yeah, you we're, can't, we gotta wrap you're going to keep tangent, and yeah. I don't even know why I started talking about that one thing. Um, I'm just joking. I know. <laughs> so this is, this is uh, the beginning of the Redifort crater that Joseph carved, um, just kind of give you guys an idea um, of what it looks like before they turn into the um, into the skins that they do, and then um, oh, I've got this last piece. This is almost done. Um, this is another piece. Again, we're really interested in playing with color. So this is a piece that we just installed at the soap factory um, in Minneapolis. This is about 200 or so. Um, again, fake rocks that we're playing with, and again, really thinking about color. We started reading. So like the beginning of us like looking at like uh, the idea of a Doppler effect, which just will probably talk in a few minutes and talk like five minutes about. Um, but I'm going to just talk about the piece really quick. Um, the piece, it's really, really like pale blues and a little like dark, dark blues on one side. And as you start to walk through the piece, it ends up turning into this like fluorescent orange. So the idea is that a body orbits this piece. And as they orbit, it's constantly changing color. It's constantly changing form. Um, and so again, it's making a person kind of perform with the object and be a part of it and be able to kind of change the way. So it's thinking, almost thinking about those like holographic images and you manipulating it. You are the one who's changing what it is. Do you want to talk more about it or is that good? I think that's great. Okay. I'm just going to say that waves <laughs> are really cool and the electromagnetic <laughs> spectrum is also really cool. That's good. Cool. All right. Um, which brings us to the very, very, very last slide. Um, which is because we just wanted to briefly, like, we, you know, we'll talk, we can talk about it in the gallery if anybody's interested. But we're well, going back to really quickly these, um, these foam pieces. Again, thinking about the way that Joseph and I was, uh, we were working, using silicone as, the, as a, a tool to make another thing, these foam pieces started to turn into that for us as well. That we were saving every single one of the carvings because those were like the drawings for those. Those were the originals, but we were never replicating them. The idea was never to reuse these pieces um, unless we were using them for like samples to test colors, but they were never meant to recreate pieces. And so we just had stacks of them sitting and we were kind of in love with them, in love with the idea of like, this is like, this is the original, this is the, the positive. And so we started kind of painting them and playing around and thinking about them and also thinking about image compilations like this. Um, this was taken... This is uh, one of the Mars rovers, and they don't take these single images. They take hundreds and hundreds of images. They all get compiled together, 
and starting to kind of think about that in our work as well because we're so we were so, we were so much into making like these singular pieces these singular materials rather than thinking about like play with lots of materials play with object and kind of see what we can if we can create those kind of same like landscapes or those same feelings and so the piece that we have in here has been really exciting for us because it's been every single piece of foam, every single material that we have carved, that we have used, painted this black and started to be compiled together to kind of create this really intense like moonscape. Yeah, and it's also kind of like our studio scape. It's kind of, it, you know what I mean? It's like being in the studio at night and there's ab the absolute absence of light and kind of like, again, this kind of tactility and navigation through touch and so this kind of, this show really unpacks around uh, what would be two, two years of, of carvings and kind of the way in which we, we really wanted to like bring all of these things together and, and to, yeah. So yeah. Good ending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great speaking skills, yeah, yeah. Good, uh, Good mm. job. All right. All right. Well, we did just talk the whole time. Just as like, we want to be conversational. It's like, he's, that's never going to happen. Yeah, are there, are there questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you talked about like crying with Carl. Um, and, and um, right, like, I guess I guess I was wondering, because it looks like you're, you're using um, sort of the space and the universe and, and the stuff that's out there to sort of, um, as kind of a lens look at um, lots of things here. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I, I guess I wonder, like, I mean, you know, you said you said you had sort of this experience that was like, oh, well, this is it. Like, I mean, could you say a little bit more about that? Like, I'd Well, that experience was also paired with, we had been working a lot with kind of suspension of moment, the kind of way in which we experience time at different... Like, so, I had grown up in the country and had been in many car wrecks, you know? And so, ex you, in these certain moments of trauma, like, your body, like, you experience time in this absolutely different sense. And so, what we were really playing with was, as this moment of us hiking through Glacier National Park, which is one of the best national parks that everybody should go to, um, but we were actually caught in the middle of a giant rock fall, so much that like at the moment it was occurring in my post 9-11 mind, I'm like, a plane just crashed in the mountain. Sarah thought that thunderstorms had just pulled, rolled in. It was like in. the scariest hike we've ever taken in our entire lives. And we were like trapped on the top of a mountain and just crossed a glacier and then had a rock fall. And we were, yeah, but it was like this, it, that was like a really important moment for us because yeah, it kind of like lasted way longer than you could imagine. Yeah, so or I think we're have. just looking more at like the parallels of these moments within the natural world and kind of like, again, bringing parallels back to like, you know, human experience. Yeah, but then it's also, I mean, one of the most important things I've been thinking about is like, and if you, any, any, almost any documentary or any time you hear um, any astronaut talk is they're constantly saying like, if everybody could see Earth from space, that things would be different. Like, because it is, it's again, it's so easy. It's something that's so easy for us to do is to constantly forget. And I'm so, I'm very happy. Like, I love that this is like what I'm reading about, what I'm making work about. It's making me think about things in such a different way because before I was so preoccupied with everything completely just around me and, and it was me, me, me. Um, and then starting to think about like this space, like we are this little tiny thing, like flying through something that's so much bigger then we can understand, and it's, but it's, and it makes what we have here so precious and beautiful because we're the only thing we know that has this. And there's probably, I mean, there's good chance there's something else out there, but we don't know about it. And we'll, I mean, who knows if we'd ever find it? And but we're on this like little magical planet that's got a terrifying amount of like plants and animals and people, and and that to constantly to be thinking about this idea of like us as part of it, like space isn't space like we are in it like we are part of it and to be thinking about that more kind of give it gives me this really it's this very different perspective than i used to have yeah it really helps us like not freak out riding on harlem avenue you know what i mean <laughs> well no 
just this, this perspective through scale relationships of looking to this, the, you guys should all watch the Eames film from 1977 called The Powers of Ten. Mm -hmm. But it's going from, and it's now been updated because in 1977 you can see what we knew then about the scale relationships to what we know now. But you can go to the quantum foam level or the Planck, which is the smallest uh, measurement to the largest measurement, which is, you know, the microwave background radiation that's been observed in our expanding universe. And really, like, it just helps us relate to you. It helps us be able to talk to you, you know. Um, now you are starting thinking, to sound like a motivational speaker. Okay, great. It's this thing. It's this know, thing is, is changing me in you. a bad look, way. Yeah, maybe okay. I shouldn't look at you. All right. I want to look at you. It's getting too close. I All right. <laughs> Did that answer your question, sir? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Anything Anyone? else? It's you guys have been awesome. Yeah. And we're very happy to be here. And thank you for coming tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Great. <laughs>